Hi folks, Simon here, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to our Xenoblade Chronicles Let's Play series. I hope you guys are enjoying these episodes, I certainly am. Uh, this is actually episode 3 now, so we're making good progress already. We're going to be entering the first dungeon of our playthrough today, which is the Tefra Cave, located just ahead of us. And it looks like it's just going to be Shulk and Ryan, eh? Well, maybe, maybe not, we'll see what happens. But just approach the story destination marker here, or the story quest marker, I should say. And that will kick us off into our next cutscene here. So we'll see what happens. And who is this? You forgot something. Well, wouldn't you know, it's Fiora. We'll be needing the transport cases, right? Being particularly helpful saves us trekking back to get these cases for the ether cylinders we're going to be collecting. I'm coming along as well. I'd feel better going with you boys than sitting at home worrying about you. Okay. So, let's get moving. I knew she didn't trust me. Looks like it. Well, there you have it. Surprise, surprise. We're going to have a party of three. Uh, so we can go ahead and close here. We are going to get a couple of tutorials. The first of all speaks about the party gauge, which appears in the upper left-hand corner of the screen when in battle. And as you can see, it's three bars. And that's going to be useful for numerous things. Uh, we build these bars up just by taking certain actions in combat. Now, the first thing we're going to be able to do with these bars is actually revive dead party members. So if you have the party gauge filled, uh, you can simply approach incapacitated party members. And then you'll have the icon that you can see on screen right now appear. And if you tap the B button on the controller, you'll be able to resurrect them. And the other thing we can do with the party gauge are chain attacks. Chain attacks are very nice, which we'll talk about them a little bit more, though, as we actually, you know, get to use them in combat. Uh, okay. And there is a quest here, you can see. That's what that icon, uh, icon indicates there. But as I mentioned before, we're not going to be doing quests, the optional side quests, rather, immediately. Now, we are going to be doing them eventually, okay? So don't think we're missing out on them. We're not. We are going to be covering all the content. But in my experience with Xenoblade Chronicles... You're better off waiting so you can maximise affinity gains with various party members later on. So, yeah, we're not going to be touching those for the time being, which does mean we're going to be a little bit weaker because we're not going to be getting the various rewards and experience gains from completing those optional quests. But in the long run, it is worth it. So just bear with me on this, okay? And we're going to head into the dungeon proper here. And this, I believe, will introduce us to another tutorial thing we have spoken about before in terms of aggro, but uh, cutscene first, though. Okay, there are going to be some tough enemies here, some of which will just make mincemeat out of us, but we can avoid them. And that's generally going to be what happens throughout all of the game. Most areas are going to have a bunch of enemies that are around your level. Uh, that you are, of course, able to kill and use them to build up experience gains and rewards and what have you. But then there's usually going to be a couple of enemies around that you cannot kill at that stage. So we need to just make sure we're keeping an eye out for them so that we can avoid them. And we can avoid them using the aggro system. So this is what we're going to be introduced to next. The aggro system is going to uh, determine whether a monster is going to aggro us when we get close to them. Or whether they can be avoided. And each monster will have this icon above them. Now you can see on the screen right now that these particular monsters shown have kind of like just a brown icon. This is actually classed as no icon at all. And these monsters will ignore us unless we attack them. However, if that brown icon has this eye in the middle of it, as is the case with the cute Brog, then we can either, you know, go in front of them into their line of sight and they will attack us, or we can run behind them or out of their line of sight by keeping a distance and they will leave us alone. So they're the two that we are being introduced to right now, but there are other aggro icons that we'll experience a little bit later on, but not immediately. So again, Xenoblade is just introducing us to these features little by little uh, so that we can learn them as we go. So we're going to move further into the cave now, and as soon as we do so, you're going to notice that there are a bunch of enemies here. Now, these enemies are going to be a mixture of aggro enemies. You can see that two have just plain brown icons, so we can actually move around them without being seen. But one does have an eye icon, so we need to avoid its line of sight, otherwise it is going to attack. And that's all very well, you can defeat them, but they are actually very strong. So just bear in mind that, at least initially here, you might want to avoid some of the encounters. But we're about to improve our gear. However, this particular fight here is going to involve a unique creature. As you can see, it's got that yellow icon. We definitely want to avoid that. 
and you do discover a new location, the Caterpillar Nest. So we will be coming back to take care of these creatures a little bit later on, but for now, as I say, it's a good idea just to give them a bit of a berth. Now, you're going to head over to the story destination, or the story quest marker here, I should say. Not the destination, because we still need to go further. Uh, and that's going to trigger another cutscene, and also a new landmark, the Magmel Ruins. So because this is a new man, uh, landmark, we're going to be able to uh, fast travel here and from here to other places at our leisure. Which is nice, because we're about to do that. But first, let's move on and watch the cutscene. See what's going on. So this is an interesting place. We're now actually out of the cave Are itself. The Magmel ruins? Haven't you been here before? Nope. The defense force often uses it for training, but I come here to do research. It's not really a place that people go. Not surprising. There are monsters around here that use Mekon parts as armor. Was this built by the Mekon? I don't think so. There's a path for people to get in. It might have been a vehicle of some kind. Like the Defense Force hover transports. A vehicle? But it's so big. It's amazing technology. I wonder what kind of people made it. I ain't got a clue. Let's keep moving. The ether cylinders are up ahead. Right. So this is kind of a mysterious place. Seems like the Defense Force use it for training, but Shulk seems to be familiar with it as well. Now, we actually get introduced to the skip travel feature, as fast travel is known in Xenoblade. Uh, although we have used this before, so we should be somewhat familiar with it. We're just going to grab this here, and what we're going to do then is uh, head back to Colony 9. Now, don't worry, because we've unlocked the landmark, the Magnal Ruins, we're actually going to be able to head straight back here once we're done in Colony 9, without having to traverse the landscape uh, again. So let's just go ahead, select Colony 9 here. And then go to the gem man stall. And the reason for this is there's a couple of things we can do to sort out our gear. Which is going to be really helpful. Even for this particular dungeon. So those enemies that we skipped we might even stand a little bit of a, bit of a better chance against. Uh, and we're going to speak to the gem man here. And he's going to give us some dialogue. Talking about one of the crafting features in Xenoblade. Which is gemming. So hello there young gun. I got something that might interest you. Rather something to tell you, it's about this here furnace. When creatures die, they leave ether crystals behind. Everyone knows that, don't they? Ether particles in the body are... Uh, oops, that stuff's too complicated. Just remember that creatures drop ether crystals when they die. But I haven't got to the best part yet. Ready? Don't be shocked. This furnace compresses ether crystals and removes impurities. You use it to make ether gems. What? No reaction. Hmm, kids these days, you just don't know how amazing this thing is. You can use the furnace to make ether gems. They've got the powers of ether crystals but highly condensed. Those ether gems can give you all sorts of powers. They're great for use in the home or by the defense force. Just put them in weapons or armor with slots. What? That's not much of a reaction. Ah, never mind. It'll probably be quicker for you to just try it. If you want to give it a try, just put gems in your weapon slots. That weapon of yours will do fine. Okay, so ultimately by speaking to this fella, we actually get our first two gems. These are strength up level 2 and HP up level 2. Very nice gems and I'm going to show you exactly what we do with them. Uh, but it's worth noting as well that we can make our own gems, but not at the moment. So when we are able to do so, we literally come back to this furnace here and we can use ingredients we've been picking up to create strong gems to help us boost the stats and give abilities to our gear. Okay then, right, so let's go ahead and open up our main menu. No, 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 I didn't even mean to save there, that's fine though. And go to change equipment, and then if we see the junk sword here that Shulk has equipped, you can see it has two empty slots there. So we can easily uh, head over here and slot in those gems that we were just given. The HP up level 2, which boosts our HP by 12%, which is really nice. And then also strength up level 2, which raises strength by a flat total of 20. Also really nice. But that's not the only thing we can do while we're taking this detour over to Colony 9. Uh, we can actually make our way over to the shop and start purchasing some gear as well. So the shop is located just over here. I'll just show you where this is on the map. 
Okay, just near the entrance of Colony 9. And there's a few things we're going to be able to purchase. Um, although, of course, we are going to need money to do so. We do have some starting funds of 3,000 gold. And if you have a save file uh, from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, then when you first start the game, you get the option to just get a free 100,000 gold, which you've probably done if you had that. Although, if you do not choose to get that money there and then, you can no longer get it when you're playing the game. Just bear that in mind. Right then, so you can see there's a few weapons here. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and purchase a couple of things, such as the Iron Pike, which we can uh, purchase to give this to Ryan. Okay, and we can purchase some defense knives if we want to, but I'm actually uh, going to leave those for the time being. Actually, no, I'm going to purchase them because they are going to be an upgrade, even though they are fairly expensive. So next up then, we can you can see we've got armor here. Uh, you can purchase some of this as well. In fact, I probably will. But first of all, let's just see what we can equip in terms of those weapons on our party members. So head back over to change equipment. And then if we just move over to... Uh, Ryan first of all and replace his scrap driver with the iron pike which is a nice boost to his damage actually and if we just go back over to Shulk here yep we're going to get some armor for him and then we're going to change these hunting knives for the defense knives as you can see a whopping big boost there for Fiora okay so we've got a little bit of gear left I've been playing too much Final Fantasy a little bit of gold left so let's just stock up on some armor. Uh, I would suggest early on that weapons do take priority because of the fact that that boost in damage is just going to help us get through battles even faster. Okay, so we can purchase some stuff here for Shulk. You can see on the right hand side there if it's going to be an upgrade uh, for various party members. So let's go ahead and purchase the nine cap. Okay, and for Rain, we're also going to get him a nine cap, although we've actually run out of money. By the way, you can go to sell here if you want to make some money. And then you can sell, for example, some of the weapons that we're no longer using. Along with any junk or items that you've been collecting from various places. Okay. So, there yeah, we can go ahead and sell some of this stuff. Look, some of this loot. Just like that. And then if we head back to buy, then we might be able to afford some more of the armor but as we go through various battles and what have you in this dungeon uh, we can just head back of course in order to stock up on more stuff so yeah we are running a little bit low on fundage here uh, but yeah i was going to get the nine top can't quite afford that just yet so we'll come back later on right so let's just head back once again to change equipment and we'll give a nine cap to shulk and also a nine cap to ryan there and we could sell that other armor that we've just taken off. But we'll leave that for now, I think. Okay, right, so with that done, we're going to head back to the previous dungeon. So that just means we need to select the Tefra Cave. And from there, we can select the Magmal Ruin. So that was the landmark that we discovered, of course. Right, so welcome back to the Magnal Ruins. Now, ahead of us, we have this enemy pack. We're actually going to take them on. So this is pretty much the first encounter we're going to have done for a while. Now, if like me, you've generally been avoiding fights up until this point, you'll probably be about level 5. So, this particular enemy pack might not be all that simple. So, you do need to pay attention, but you will actually get some experience and level up fairly quickly. So, you might want to spend just a little bit of time in this area grinding some mobs now that we've got some better gear and some gems and stuff. As this is probably the first opportunity that we've had to do so. And you'll also get a little bit of gold as well. So if you want to purchase more gear, then I'll show you what will be best to get uh, in a few moments time. But let's just go ahead and try and take care of this first enemy encounter here. So we'll open with a backslash there. Uh, as we start unleashing some melee attacks, some auto attacks. Now, one thing to note, you do have this heal ability with Shulk. So don't be afraid to use it. And if you can keep the enemies separated from each other as well, then uh, that will also be particularly useful. Uh, but if you do get them as a group, then you should still be strong enough to take them on. Just make sure you really pay attention to uh, various healing and just, you know, the damage that's incoming and stuff. So let's go ahead here and take care of the next set of enemies. Now, the whole while here, we're building up our party gauge up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, although we've got no real reason to use it as of yet. But, you know, it's good just to note that that is there still. Uh, as it always will be, of course. So it looks like we're just about to get all three party members here to level 6. 
which, you know, these early levels, they do provide quite the boost in terms of uh, stats and what have you. And we get some battle leggings as well. It's actually possible as well to get some defense knives from these enemies. So they're the knives that we purchased for Fiora. Uh, I did want to purchase them though just to make sure that she was going to be suitable in battle. But just bear that in mind as well. You might get some spare. So yeah, you can, you know, just pop around killing some of the encounters. Here. Just remember to be careful of some of the tougher enemies that we've already gone past. Uh, but those bugs and stuff, you know, they should be fair game for you at this point. And not only, as I say, you're going to get some experience... Uh, but you're also going to hopefully, you know, get some treasures and stuff that you can sell uh, for gold as well at the shops. Okay, so I've killed a few enemies, done a little bit of farming for about 10 to 15 minutes, not a huge amount really. And I've stopped back at town just to, you know, purchase some more gear. So this is where I am right now after this brief grinding session so that you guys, if you want to keep up with me, can also know when to stop. So I've got all of my party members to level 8, so we gained 3 levels since the start of the episode through that grinding, which as you can see, you know, it even provides a notable boost to HP there along to the stats as well. I've just leveled up some of their arts, it doesn't really matter too much at this stage where you pump points in terms of arts, but uh, just try and stay on top of them so that you can, you know, just keep unleashing extra damage in that during combat and stuff, uh, but that's where I am. Uh, right, next up then in terms of equipment... You can see the equipment I've got here. Now, some of this was purchased from the shops, such as... Uh, actually, I don't think any of those was purchased from the shops, but on some of the other party members, um, just the weapons, really. Uh, most of this was actually found from the various chests that have dropped after killing enemies. I was quite fortunate in that I got some of these unique items as well. Uh, purple indicates unique items, which means that the developers have actually fixed the stats and gem slots that are on that gear. Okay, and you can see that as well, so it actually comes with gems socketed into it, which is really nice. Uh, there we have it then, guys. So it's not a huge grind, to tell you the truth. And don't worry if you're not as fortunate as I am in getting purple gear there. You will do as you continue to play, and it doesn't really, you know, provide a bigger boost as you might expect at this stage of the game. But later on, it can be very nice indeed as it gets more powerful and stuff. Okay, right, so let's move on. So we're going to head up the ramp at this point. Now, there is a unique monster that lurks around... Uh, up around here somewhere so we just need to be careful to avoid that it's actually on the other side of this corridor that we're going into so there's a door there that's currently locked okay indicated by the red color on the uh, light there so the green ones we can go through but just through here is where that unique enemy tends to hang out so just be a little bit careful because you know he's probably going to kill you if you aggro him although it is possible to run away Okay, I can't see him, so we're not going to fight these enemies here. Okay, yeah, I can see on the map he's actually coming around the corner. So, yeah, we'll just move out of here before he does so. Uh, by the way, just a heads up, you can see that these enemies have blue icons instead of the usual brown. All that means is that because we've done a little bit of grinding, that these are now lower level than we are. So, if you see an enemy that has a blue icon, then that just means it's lower level than you. So, in most cases, you should be able to take it on without too much trouble. But even unique monsters you know, can be quite difficult, even if they're lower level, so you do need the right strategies for them. Right, so we're just going to follow the path around here, and you can see there's a story marker just up ahead, which we're going to run into. This actually gives us the landmark rear entrance, and pretty much brings us out of the dungeon. So here we go, more cutscene time, yay. Well, more loading screen time. And then we just need to move forward, okay, to the next story marker before the cutscene. Uh, but before we do that, let's just take a brief look over here. We can see Colony 9 down below. Get to see it from uh, quite the distance here. And I hope you guys can swim because we've got a long fall down there. But not just yet, not just yet. Let's see what's going on. Right here. Thanks for the help, Shulk. I'll start collecting them up. You two hold on a sec. It's full of ether cylinders. Hey, why do we have to come all the way here to get them? Isn't there an ether cylinder fueling station in the colony? Well, refining the ether takes a long time down there. And sometimes cylinderization fails. And there are so many cylinders here for us already. It's more reliable than making them ourselves. Right. And Colony 9's anti-air batteries and mobile artillery are standardized for these cylinders. So they can be used straight away. I see. 
You know, this place is in good condition considering it's ancient. It might be that there's some form of technology being used to preserve it. It's just a shame we don't understand its secret. Shulk? But I'll solve it one day and show you. If it's just technology that someone created in the past, it's not incomprehensible. We'll come to understand it one day. Don't go trying too hard. We can come and get ether cylinders whenever we need them. Besides, it's a good place for Defense Force training. Yeah, so good that you didn't even want to come here without Shulk to back you up. Anyway, did you collect the cylinders? Yep, all done. Thanks. Just come by yourself from now on. Shh, be quiet. Okay, so, seems like there's something else going on here. What's this? Yeah, they don't look like the usual mech on that we've been witnessing already, do they? So, maybe they're not. But we've got a fairly tough battle here, which is one of those reasons that grinding was going to, you know, be useful. And it's going to come into its own here. So, we've got two enemies, and we are told about switching targets, which we already know about. Uh, we're also going to be making sure that we issue commands here. The command we're going to be issuing is to make sure that our party members attack the same target that we do. Which is the up button on the D-pad. As you can see there, focus attacks. So we're going to do that immediately. Yeah, this is going to be a close one, I think. Whoops, I actually died right at the end of that encounter. Okay, so we'll try it again. Uh, just pay a little bit more attention to it. It's probably a good idea. So we do need to inflict topple. Now to do, well we don't need to, but it'll be a big help if we can. Uh, and that's by casting a purple ability followed by a green ability. So I'll cast a purple ability and as you can see we toppled the enemy once. I believe Ryan cast wild down, which is a green ability. And we'll do that to support our party members. So we're going okay at the moment. Just keep focusing one at a time here. Make things a little bit easier. Once one's down, then the rest of the battle is usually a formality, so long as we've got a fair bit of HP, which at the moment I haven't. Okay, there goes one. So I think we should be okay on this occasion. Let's just make sure that we stay on top of HP levels. And just one more Ancient Machine to go here. So Ryan's in a little bit of bother here. We might be able to get a chain attack off. I'm just concerned about his HP. Oh no, we're sorted. We didn't need to. Brilliant. Fiora, are you okay? I'm fine. How about you? I'm all right. Thanks to you and Ryan. What on Bionis were those? I've never seen anything like them. Could they have been Mechon? No. I think they were something left by the civilization that built this vehicle. They didn't seem like Mechon to me. Yeah, as per our suspicions, they certainly were not Mechon. I don't know. Yeah, it seems there were some kind of anti-defense machines that were built a long time ago. Might have been activated in response to something. Yeah, but what could that have been? But I don't think that something could have been us. Please, let's go back. I don't want to be here anymore. Me neither. And we've already got the ether cylinders. Right, okay. So it seems like we got what we came for, but we're not going to be able to get out that easily. That sound. In the sky. Oh, oh, it's a... This can't be. No way. Macon. Defense mechanism have responded to the mechon. Let's get back to the colony. Come on. Indeed. So we've seen exactly why the uh, defensive machines were activated. Then 
and it seems there's a massive mech on attack that's occurring on Colony 9, so it looks like we've got our work cut out for us. So we're going to finish off the episode here today, and we're going to pick up next time. We've got some exciting times ahead, trust me on that, guys. So you might want to use the opportunity to save here, take a break for a bit if you need to, and then we'll pick up in episode 4 as we head back to Colony 9 and see exactly what's going on down there with the mech on. And no doubt we'll have a few battles ahead of us, so I hope you guys will look forward to that. Anyway, thanks for stopping by. I hope you all have a wonderful day in your various activities, and I'll see you next time for more Xenoblade Chronicles. So don't forget, guys, uh, go ahead and check me out on Twitch if you haven't already, and drop a follow over there since I do live stream. Not this game, but other games that I'm currently playing as well. All right, everyone, see you next time.